month we've been focusing on adoption and part of the reason for that is simply because if you read through the New Testament, children are really important to God. And as we're sharing adoption, you may not be called to that. That is totally fine. We're simply taking a month and we're putting it out in front because maybe God does want to move in that way. But whether he wants to move in that way in your life or not, I can tell you this, God wants to make a difference in the lives of children through you in one way or another. But you know, one of the things when it comes to children that you give up if you get involved in their life is that you often give up silence. The golden gift of silence. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I like silence. Some of you have been sitting out in a tree stand somewhere lately, and you've been enjoying a little bit of silence. And as much as I enjoy our kids and all that come with it, sometimes when they leave and head for school and you get that golden moment, you know, where it's like, what do I hear? Nothing. Oh, (laughs) kind of nice. But you know, after a while, it's not so nice because God has created us to be in relationship. And God really cares about children. And part of the reason that He calls us to make a difference in their life is because they are in a place where they need help. They're not yet fully grown. They're not yet fully developed. There's a lot of things that they don't understand. There's a lot of things that they are unable to do on their own. And so they need someone to step in. And many times, the someone that should be there stepping in and and providing is not there. And so God calls other people. But one of the things that we've got to get over is this. We've got to get over the fact of, well, that's not my place. I I mean, that, you know, that, uh, that's not my kid or, you know, uh, I mean, and I'm not even just talking about adoption here. I'm just talking about, you know, stepping in life, you know, well, that, that could get messy. Uh, you you know, I I enjoy my peace. Well, sometimes, sometimes silence can be evil. Sometimes silence can be evil. You see, when I have the ability to step in and to make a difference and I choose not to, you know what that is? That's evil. You know, one of the things that Stephanie was sharing as as we were praising, right? We were talking about that's how we go to war against the enemy is partly through our mouths, through speaking out, through speaking out praise to the Lord. But you know what else? It's speaking truth. When you speak out truth, the enemy hates it. Because another thing that was about is the enemy is not a creationist. He's not. But he is an illusionist, and that's absolutely right. I want you to hear this. Sin is always illusion. Sin is always illusion, and here's what I mean by that. Sin has an appeal. We say, "Ah, that looks really good. I think that would really bless me. Total illusion, no matter what it is. Because if it's sin, it's actually not going to bless you. It's actually going to harm you. But the enemy has to put this veneer on it that makes it look appealing, knowing that if you step into it, it's going to harm you. And we have that all around you. How do we defeat that? We speak truth. We speak truth. Truth can make such a difference. Right now, we are seeing children targeted in a number of ways. We are seeing children targeted in the way that we have people who want to um, infuse um, sexual deviance and perversion and all kinds of things into young minds. I mean, even if you don't know the Lord, that's nuts. That's crazy. So why would it happen? Well, here's why it happens. You have a small group that is completely deceived by the enemy. And so they're pushing something. Here's what they're counting on. Here's the only way it can happen. The only way that it can happen is that most of us... That's that's not my battle. Uh, uh, That's a political issue. Uh, You know, I... mm, I I just, that's not my place. I'm going to stay over here. 
Well, when we choose not to speak truth, what happens is that the enemy is able to move forward. I want to give you an example. I've mentioned this before, but I mean, it is so uh, eerie how connected it is to where we are right now. I want to go back to Hitler for a minute, okay? Uh, Hitler was killing an entire population. Uh, Hitler had decided that if you were of Jewish origin, you were just evil and he was going to just take you out. Well, at that time, somehow he was able to convince 3,000 churches in Germany, 3,000 churches that, that he knew what he was talking about and they should support him. Now, I don't know if he convinced them he knew what he was talking about, but well, however it was, he got them to support him. So 3,000 churches said, we're on board, we stand behind him. 3,000 other churches stood up and said, absolutely not. Absolutely goes against the word of God. That is absolutely wrong. Well, that's pretty good. You got three for, three against. So how in the world did it move forward? Well, there were more than 6,000 churches. You know how many there were? 18. So you had 12 that were silent. Who? Hey, that's not my issue. Uh, you know, that's a political thing. I got news for you. When someone in a political in position enters into a moral issue, that's no longer a political issue. That is a moral issue. You know, one of the things we're going to look at, we're, we're going to look at a scripture. Um, we're not going to read this part of it, but, but just before the part we're going to look at in the gospel, it's going to talk about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had his head taken off. You know why John the Baptist had his head taken off? Because he told a political leader that he was being immoral. Well, what, you're not supposed to do that, John? Really? Where's that scripture at? No, he was supposed to speak out against that. You know why he's speaking out against that? Because what that leader was doing was he was affecting family. And you know what that does? It affects children. God really cares about children. And so even if God has not called us to maybe adopt one into our own family, God calls us to speak up when children are being targeted, harmed, whatever. How do we do that? We just speak truth. That's all we do. I'm not asking you to threaten anybody. I'm asking you simply to speak truth. Hey, that's not right. And if we all do that together, stand together and say, hey, that's not right. Guess what? The Lord is able to move through that. I want to go to a scripture this morning. The scripture is in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 46. I want to look in part about what keeps us from doing this. In, Luke, in uh, verse 46. Six, the very first one, uh, there's, there's something I want you to notice here. So Jesus is about to talk, but it tells us what's going on before he talks. In verse 46, it says this. Then his disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest. Now, before we move on, I, I want to stop there for a second. The disciples are sitting around arguing about who is the greatest. What does that look like? Have you ever heard somebody sitting around saying, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. That's not what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. I was in the stand, and that thing had to have been 200 yards out. I put my finger in the air and felt the wind, and I aimed my gun a little high, and we come out with these crazy stories, and then the person next to us says, oh yeah, that's nothing. You know what I did? Or maybe it has to do with the game. Oh yeah, you made a decent shot over there, but did you see what I did over here? You ever been in one of those conversations? You bet you have. Every one of us have. We just get drawn in, right? What are we really doing? Right there. That's what we're doing. Which one of us is the greatest? 
That's what we're going for. I mean, when you hear the scripture say that, you're like, oh, wow, that's really bad. How, who would do that? All of us. We look for opportunities to brag about things that we've done. Why? Because in our minds, that elevates our worth. I want you to hear what Jesus has to say about that. Verse 47, but Jesus knew their thoughts. So he brought a little child to his side. And then he said to them, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. How do we get that affirmation that we're really desiring? Because I got to tell you, I've done it before. The whole, oh yeah, well I've done this. And I always leave empty. I never actually feel like, uh, what I was going for. And, and, and if you live a while, what you find is that people start to avoid you when you're that person who's always talking about yourself and how great you are. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus saying, hey, if you want to be the greatest, which means that you, you, you want to feel affirmed, how do you do that? He's saying you reach out for the most vulnerable among you, and you serve them. You welcome them. That's what he's saying. Why? Because here's what happens when you do that. You give up some things. You give up some silence, right? You give up some other things. But I want to tell you the rewards that come are way beyond that. Because what he's saying there is that when you do that, you invite the presence of God into your life. You invite the presence of the Father. You invite the presence of Jesus. And I'm telling you, when you experience that, there's nothing else like it. And so when you experience what actually happens, I don't even have to tell you, hey, you really need to stop bragging on yourself all the time. Because you're going to figure it out like, you know what? This is way more rewarding is serving those who are in need than sitting around trying to convince people how great I am. Because once again, you'll find it actually has the opposite effect on people. Rather than being drawn to you, they're like, oh, hmm, they're so-and-so. I think I'll, you know, go this way. But when we start to reach out and serve people, you know what happens? People want to be around you. People want to be around you. And part of the reason they're going to want to be around you is because they're going to sense something in you, and that is the presence of God. When you welcome children. What does that mean to welcome? Okay. Well, when you think of being welcomed somewhere, what, what do you feel from that? Well, you feel valued by someone, right? They're, they're paying attention. So children, for instance, need attention. They desire attention. But you know what? We all do. That's why those guys were bragging about themselves. Because <laughs> they want some attention. But you know what the problem is? Is when I'm trying to get attention, you know what I'm not doing? I'm not paying attention to anybody else around me who actually desires attention. And what I found is that when I stop thinking about myself, and I start looking at other people, and I start giving attention, then I actually receive the reward that I was wanting over here when I was sitting around thinking about myself. That's where I receive it. And so when we talk about welcoming children, what are we doing? Well, we're providing attention, okay? So think about that. In your life right now, where are places that, that you can give attention? Because when you give attention, you can make a difference in their life because you make them feel valued and when you make them feel valued they want to hear from you and when they want to hear from you you're able to speak truth into their life and so that the person over here who's given them attention for the wrong reason because they want to exploit them somehow well guess what you can be the person who rescues because you are speaking into them also and you are valuing them and they want to hear from you and they're willing to hear truth but it starts with just giving attention. 
Stop, paying, uh, stop focusing on ourselves and being like, well, I'm too busy. I'm too important. You know, that's one of the things that we found with the disciples in other areas. When the children would come to Jesus, they're like, whoa, kids, get back. This is an important person. And Jesus is like, yeah, and this is what I care about, the children. God wants us to be his hands and feet in that. What else does he want to do? When you think about welcoming, okay? You think about being given attention. Also, there's a safety aspect. You know, there's a, there's a protection. You feel at ease. You feel safe. And so we want to provide. How do we do that? Well, I don't know. You just, you ask the Lord. But there may be ways that you can do that. Maybe, you know, at your job or, you know, or in your home situation. I don't know what it is. But it's providing attention. It's providing safety. And then it's giving direction as well to them. Because once again, as children are developing, do they have everything figured out? No. But you've got some more experience. And you can step in and help. And you can step in and, and guide them back to the truth. But what does all of this take? It takes stepping out of your peace and quiet. Okay? It takes getting involved. It takes opening up your mouth. And it takes speaking truth to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And what's going to come to you through that? Well, Again, I, I just want to, I want to read that. I read it, but I, I want to I read it again. Anyone who welcomes me, well, first of all, it says, anyone who welcomes a little child on my behalf welcomes me. So we're welcoming the Lord. We're welcoming Jesus. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. And then he says, whoever the least among you is the greatest. Because here's the thing, when you start focusing on children, you, you're actually not going to get a lot of attaboys from the world. Why? Because in the world's eyes, children are not that important. Why? Because children can't give them a whole lot. And the world is all centered around giving attention to the one who can give me something. And for those who, who want to exploit and so on, well, guess what? You're getting in their way at that point. You might get some heat. And so you're not going to necessarily feel like the greatest when you're serving. You're going to feel like the least in the world's eyes. But here's what God says. You're going to be the greatest. Why? Because you are going to experience the presence of God. You are going to experience rewards from Him in the here and now and in the hereafter. I mean, just, just imagine for a second, you're standing before the Lord. You haven't received any accolades here on earth. But all of a sudden, the Lord begins to show you the who were once children who you made a difference in their life. Just little things. I, maybe you were teaching, okay? Maybe you're teaching some kind of class. Maybe it's somebody that you just had a relationship with and you just, you paid attention to. You know, maybe you just sent them someplace and you regularly pay attention. Maybe you invited them to something. Maybe, you know, you're, again, you're, they're not in your family, but they're in your neighborhood. I don't know. And you, you decide to, you know, take them places sometimes. Just pay attention to them. I, whatever it is. You can make a difference. And in God's eyes, that is really important. Jesus made it super clear how important it was. Over and over, he would pay attention to the children. And I, I'm reminded right now of, of a threat that he made to anyone who would harm a child and how it would be better for them if they hadn't been born. Jesus takes it really seriously. And so no matter what your calling is, there are ways that you can make a difference. I'm just saying, be aware of that. Be open. Look for God to use you in that. And let's be God's hands and feet and mouth and arms to hug. All of those things. Let's be Jesus for others. Father, thank you.